Hey everybody, Economic Ninja here. I hope you are doing great. Got a big treat with, for you today. I have a guest on and we're going to be talking about Canada. We're going to be talking about all the crazy stuff that's happening in the country in the last year or so. And I want to also warn you that no matter where you are, but especially in America, there are people in levels of the government that are watching the government in Canada closely. Why? Because they want to follow. One government gets away with something. I think other governments are going to get away with things. And we're going to be talking about why it's so important to be changing our way of thinking when it comes to economics and our freedoms right now. Guys, Without further ado, I have Jay Martin on. Jay, how are you doing? I'm excellent. I'm recovering from a vicious flu, but otherwise I'm fantastic. It's good to see you. Yeah. Hey, I hope your mouth doesn't get dry and you start choking because then I'm just going to make fun of you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, before the interview, we, I wanted to ask you what you wanted to talk about. Now, I'm I'm getting the extreme pleasure to come and speak at your event, Cambridge House, VRIC, at the end of January. Thank you so much for allowing me to come. And I don't know exactly what we're going to do, but we're going to get everyone pretty uh, fired up. It's going to be fun. I'm glad you can come. It's a super fun show. I think this year we've got about... 300 junior mining companies in the marketplace should see about 5,000 investors and just tons of great personalities on stage like yourself, about 80, 80 to 120 keynote speakers. We're finalizing the agenda right now, but it's always a blast. Man, I'm I'm so blessed to be a part of this. And and like I said, the price is right. Can you go over actually, and, and this isn't a, sh a commercial for the show, but uh, how much are you charging for people to come see this show? So actually access to the trade show and most of the content is, is free. There's free yeah. admission. Uh, you can make it into 100% uh, of the content. You might not get the best seat in the house, but free admission. And this is, uh, you know, is driven back in the day because our core focus behind this conference is to promote interest and insight into the precious metal sector. And so, you know, we've got, like I said, about 300 junior mining companies on the trade show. You know, we don't put any barriers between the investors and the, the conference. We like we like it buzzing in there. That's huge. And so honestly, guys, you get to see people like Rick Rule, Robert Kiyosaki speak for free. I, that's honestly, it's one of the greatest opportunities, I think. And you get to be around like-minded people. And like Jay was saying, I, you know me, I'm really big into the exploration and junior mining space right now, because I believe that is what is hated right now and what uh, I want to be invested in. So sorry, without further ado, let's talk about what's going on in Canada. You got a lot of really good things you want to talk about. Well, yeah, you know, it actually is a nice segue from the conference agenda because it's it'll be a key focus of this year's event. We're flying in two uh, premieres of uh, Canadian provinces, which for, you know, our American viewers, it's provinces are like states in Canada. We have 10 provinces and three territories. We operate like states in some ways with a limited amount of sovereignty, but not nearly as much as uh, as United States. And so what we're seeing right now in Canada is uh, battle lines being drawn between our federal leadership, which my audience knows I'm, I'm no fan of and a heavy critic of, and our provincial leadership, who is also fed up with our federal leadership. Um, the way the dynamic works in Canada, and it might be similar in the United States, is that you know provinces, they generate the revenue for the country with their domestic industry. And provinces like Alberta, which are sort of known as the Texas of Canada, massive energy industry. Uh, but the federal government actually sucks up the tax revenue and then redistributes it back to the provinces, allowing them to accomplish what they call uh, transfer payments, which is just like wealth redistribution from wealthy provinces to poor ones. Um, and although they've happily accepted the revenues from energy rich provinces like Alberta and Saskatchewan, they've simultaneously hammered the country with policy and regulation that crippled that's crippled our energy sector. And so now we're seeing the center of the country, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, put forward legislation to separate themselves from the decision making of our federal leadership. And it's pretty unprecedented to see this kind of movement catch fire like it has. I mean, the Saskatchewan First Act, which was their legislation, was actually passed 43 to zero in favor. That means bipartisan support, left wing, right wing, center, doesn't matter. The whole province is on board trying to find some safe haven status, right, from our federal leadership. And, uh, you know, it's quite remarkable to see the, the this, you know, this movement spread now to include three provinces, the, you know, the breadbasket. Everybody thinks about Canada. Think about British Columbia and Vancouver and Ontario and Toronto and Quebec. But it's the center of the country where the goods come from. I mean, this is the part that's laden with resources that the world needs and wants, but they're landlocked and can't get this product to market. And that's what this fight's going to be about. So, 
to get clarity on this, I'm flying two of the premieres out to the show in January. Yeah, that's incredible. And you, yeah, to say uh, you have big names coming to the show is an understatement. Now, we've seen places like Spain try and do this before, where uh, people that have a voice try to separate themselves. Um, uh, they, they're the, the producers. What kind of impact financially can you see or economically could this happen if this goes through? Well, I think that our federal leadership responds a little bit to pressure. And uh, like any bully, right, if power's left unchecked, it runs away and gets yep. pretty crazy. And we saw that occur in Canada. We were making headlines over the last 18 months. Canada doesn't do that. It's a pretty sleepy, quiet little country. I, I love it for that reason. But obviously, when that convoy started crossing the country to raise awareness for a lot of the policies that citizens didn't like, um, you know, when the convoy reached Ottawa, our prime minister was nowhere to be found. Suddenly he had COVID and he had to go quarantine. Yeah. He wasn't there to meet the protests. Yeah. And that's to say that, you know, our federal leadership has been pressured into changing policy this way in the past. And, uh, you know, I don't expect any sort of massive separatist movement to occur or real a real shift in the relationship between the federal government and the provincial governments. But I do expect you know, our federal government to be sort of bullied into listening to the people finally, which, you know, sometimes just has to come through uh, through threatening action. And uh, when you have three very, very, you know, resource rich provinces in the center uh, suddenly banding together, creating one voice and then passing this legislation, you know, unanimously. And, and this the Alberta Sovereignty Act also passed just last week. Simultaneously, every media company in the country is saying this is, you know, uh, it's got no chance. The citizens don't support this. Albertans don't want this. And then the act gets passed the next day. It's like, OK, there's a disconnect here between liberal media and what's actually occurring on the street. Well, it's like our voting in America, and we've been seeing it forever. The bullies in our country are New York and, and California, and they have the biggest voice. Why? Because they make the most money. But like you said, the breadbasket, the producers are in the middle of our nation as well. And if we can't feed our nation because of horrible policies put forth by these two states, there's going to be some sort of uprising. But in your case, which I like the way you're putting it, it's a force. You're going to be forced to hear it. And I believe um, with people like yourself and me trying to spread this out on social media, media that more people can understand what's truly going on and then protect themselves. So let's talk about protection right now, because the question that I've been opposing to everyone, because I'm a big crypto guy, but I've I've held off on talking about it as of uh, last spring, because I said, we're going to go through a correction because of it being tied to the stock market and troubles there with uh, derivatives and such. Now, gold and silver are no, they're definitely known to have derivatives, right? When we're talking about GLD and SLV, but a lot of people are asking why gold right now and what's blowing me away. And you may be able to shed some light on this. Gold has been doing very well in the last six months versus the gaining dollar. You know, in the beginning, it started $2,000 gold around January and it dipped down to the 1600 range. But then as interest rates really started to rise, it's almost like a sense of fear has overcome uh, people or investors. Can you talk to that? Like why gold? Why now? Why is gold strengthening as the dollars is tending to strengthen over the long term, even though like today it's having a downturn? Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple things to play there, right? And if you step back and look at like the decade trend, uh, you know, the biggest buyers of gold generally, well, over the last eight years have been central banks. And that's that's a shift. That's a shift from their focus on USD as the only necessary reserve and safe haven asset uh, to you know record gold purchasing, but more importantly, like record repatriating of their gold, meaning they want the physical in their, within their borders, right? Yes. And, you know, I look at that trend and I could say, look, I'm no novel thinker and I'm no trendsetter, but I've been doing the same thing. And whenever I start thinking a certain way or believing a certain thing or taking certain actions, it's typically because I'm part of a wave. I'm receiving the same inputs as thousands of other people. And in the last year, I've doubled my physical gold holdings. Like, why is that? Well, it's all the signals I'm getting from macro from a macro standpoint. And it's it's putting me like I'm a speculator and I love the early stage investing and I invest in crypto. I invest in early stage mining stocks, some super heavyweight there. Uh, but I I only do so if I can look back at the treasury. And in my case, that's physical metal. You know, there's a hundred ounce silver shell right behind my head here. Oh, nice. Um, you know, and I, I, it just gives me the confidence to act with conviction when I see these high risk opportunities. I mean, yeah. my, my thought, and I don't make predictions, but 
you know, the 2020s are going to be how the 2020s have been, which is just this continued unprecedented trajectory of chaos and uncertainty. And what do you want to do in that scenario? You want to make sure, you know, you built your moat before you try to build your castle because you don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. Now, you can look at all kinds of safe haven, you know, assets like land, like U.S. dollars. Sure. Right. Yeah. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. So, you know, I look at a 5000 year track record of one asset and say it's pretty good. doesn't mean it determines what's going to happen over the next hundred years, but it's a pretty good indication. Good enough for me to be pretty heavyweight in that. And that just gives me the confidence to know that, like, when faced with the next crisis, because it's coming, like, don't think we're through this. Right. That's what I believe. We're probably just getting started. You want to have that optional card in your back pocket that allows you to sit there, do nothing, wait and watch, right? And, and that can only happen if you know your fortress is strong and that comes from hard assets. And I lead that with gold and silver. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And let's talk about 5,000 and 100 year cycles. Like you said, you know, a hundred years ago, we had come through the Spanish flu that led to the depression of 1920, then to the roaring twenties. And literally we are in the twenties right now. And I, I explain it to people. I say, I believe that time has become compressed over the, I mean, whether it be the tilting of the axis due to earthquakes and literally the days shaving seconds off over the last hundred years, time is compressing. And especially because of expansion and credit and availability of, of credit, right? Just low rates, easy access to credit. It makes these booms and busts higher and also lower. Um, right now, I believe that we are going to start to see an epic move in the prices of metals. And, and let's use mining as an example. You know, in, in 2010, when silver had peaked around almost hitting $50, mining stocks were just crushing it, but they were doing even better in mid 2000, around 2005, 2006. Now in the last three months where my mining stocks were down, let's say over the last year, let's say 40, 50% on average. In the last three to four months, as prices start to perk up and inflation really starts, you know, getting hot, the mining stocks are doing excellent. So let me ask you this. What do you think about the difference? And I get this question all the time. People want to speculate and dive right into mining stocks. I go, you need to be super careful because these are super volatile compared to uh, precious metals spot prices. What is your uh, thoughts on how much someone should invest in these mining stocks, whether they be explorers or juniors or majors, in comparison to how much physical you hold? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's going to come down to like what your personal insurance policy needs to look like. For example, when I was, you know, take me back eight years ago, right? Single, no kids, footloose and free. I could gamble it all, lose it all. And the next day wouldn't be that different for me. I got three kids now, you know, life's different. My insurance policy needs to be very robust. Yeah. And so all I would say is when you're looking at that, that, you know, that food chain of risk, right? The super early stage explorers, that, you know, maybe have a bit more confidence developers and then the somewhat secure producers, you know, starting with single asset up to multi-asset and quite secure. Anything in that, that expiration game, don't put it out there if you can't afford to lose it. I mean, that's just, why do you, you know, yes, you can accomplish, you know, 5X, 20X returns in that industry. But the only reason those are available to you is because of how risky it is. Yes. And you're going to take losses in order to get those wins. Like you do the work, you watch the shows like this, you subscribe to the newsletters, you do the diligence, you go to shows, you meet the CEOs. Yeah, you can find those 5X, 20X returns, but they're going to come with a handful of losses every single time because you just never know. You know, and there's way too many uncontrolled variables in that industry. It's very high risk. And so, you know, for me, it's like, <clears throat> that's where I generate profits. But, you know, that's not where I, you know, I take the cash off the table and put it in the hard asset bucket. And then I, you know, and then I might go back. But like, what I would say is rule number one is stay alive. So whatever you're putting in that high risk bucket, make sure you can afford to lose it. Now, if you're looking at like, you know, cash flowing, dividend paying production companies, royalty companies, it's obviously different. It's still very, very volatile. I mean, we're looking at the pain that the crypto market is going through right now. And part of me kind of laughs because I'm like precious and metals investors, we call that Tuesday. Like we're just yeah. used to it, right? Like yep. thick skin, it's a tough game and it'll hurt you, but it'll toughen you up. Yep. Um, and whatever you're playing with in that industry, like I'll say it again, make sure you can afford to lose it. You can achieve life-changing games. Absolutely. Right. But it's a high risk business. 100%. Yeah. And I haven't, I personally, I was, I've been knowing that this crypto market is going to take a downturn because of derivatives and leverage. Um, haven't sold any of that, that crypto in the last year, but I did pull 
you know, profits back in 2017, 2019, and 2020. Um, and I'm happy for it. As a matter of fact, right after this interview, I'm going to sign docs to uh, to liquidate one mining position, or not liquidate, pull 50% of my position because I'm up 50% and I want to mm -hmm. lock in gains. So just like you're, you're saying, I want to then take those gains. I'm going to spread them out more diversified over newer plays, things that are just now coming out. So let me ask you this too. Besides, so we've talked about Canada and the policies that are changing or hopefully changing and, and the eyeballs that are about to be on this. Uh, you brought up energy uh, at one point, and I've been talking about an energy crisis that I believe is going to rock Canada and America in the next three to four months because of what's happening in Europe. And we're starting to see shipping and freight fall off of a cliff, and we're starting to see inflation in energy because we have the dynamics of uh, falling prices, which are causing countries to slow down the spigot like OPEC+. Plus. But then we're also seeing... Um, people in the trading market, in the futures market, bidding up prices because of the cold weather that's coming. What do you think about the energy markets in Canada? Um, and if you could speak to that, that'd be great. I think we have a ton of potential and it's mainly unrealized. And let me give you a great example. The chancellor of Germany recently came to Canada to sit down with our prime minister and beg for a natural gas deal to get them through this winter. Wait, 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 hold on real quick, because the, the one with Russia didn't work out, right? The North Street 2? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just so, I crazy. Yeah, and what our brilliant leader told him was that he could not make a sound business case for that agreement. He could, however, promise hydrogen power. The only problem is we don't have any. But as per the Canadian California. government website. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. <laughs> By 2050, as per the Canadian government website, by 2050, hydrogen power could help us achieve our net zero climate goals. So as long as the Chancellor of Germany can be extraordinarily patient, we have a solution for him. Now, we do have a ton of natural gas, 1.3 trillion cubic feet, about yeah. you know, 200 years of annual, annual consumption. But we couldn't make a sound business case to do that deal right now. For the energy we have now, for the world that needs it now, to grow our economy now. These are things that exist today, yeah. tangibles, realities. Instead, we made a promise in 2050, right? And so that is, I can't come up with a better summary example of the state of our energy industry. I mean, that's the question you asked. Oh. Well, that's where we're at. Wow. Tons of potential, but it's, it's being unrealized. Well, you want to talk about getting screwed. Let's talk about Germany. I mean, wasn't it Germany that sent their officials over to America because they asked for their gold back? And the Federal Reserve says, yeah, no problem. You can have it back like in seven or 10 years. And then they're sending people back to audit here and they're coming back going, they don't got our gold. I mean, it's a perfect example. You've got energy on one side, you've got precious metals on the other, right? You have an energy crisis and literally a financial crisis around the world where currencies are collapsing in value. And when a country needs it like Germany now, they're not mm -hmm. getting it. So that's an incredible example. I gotta be honest with you, if you're in Germany right now, I don't, they, as a matter of fact, they can't even really buy precious metals, right? Aren't they taxed like crazy on all the precious metals they buy in Germany? And they're actually, they're capped, right? And it's it's telling that a country that historically has stored its gold in the US in order to keep it safe from the continual breakout of European wars now wants it from the United States back on the continent of Europe. They're more comfortable with that risk as long as they can take physical ownership, right? That's taking precedent right now. Yes. And that's back to that trend we talked about at the front end of this conversation. Like there's a wave of investors who right now want possession of their physical, right? Within reach. Why is that, right? It's not just people like me. It's central banks all over the world doing the exact same thing. Yeah, I can't, I can't uh, thank you more for not only coming on, but allowing me to come and speak in Vancouver. Uh, guys, I'm going to put a link to, to Jay's show in the description below. It's going to be in the end of January. And I'm not kidding. You shouldn't come to see me speak. <laughs> you should come and see all of the other speakers because to say that there is some serious talent coming to talk, you are going to be blown away. But really, it's not only that, it's the people that you meet in the seat next to you. That's the most important thing because you're going to find out two things. You're not alone. And then you're going to figure out what you can do and what other other people are doing to hedge themselves, not only against this crash that's coming, but the advantages of taking advantage of this crash to make some real money. Wouldn't you agree, Jay? I love that. Yeah. Thank you. And you're right. Absolutely. That's the value of these events is who you're sitting next to. And guess what? Everybody getting up there, you know, on the stage, you want to connect with Brent Johnson, Grant Williams, Lynette Zhang, Mark Moss, like 
Rick Rule, you name him, you know, we, we work really hard to build out this roster, but here's the thing, like they want to connect with you too. And after they get off the stage, they'll have that conversation. They'll join you for a 20 minute. You can ask them whatever you want. Like it's, it is a community vibe. We work really hard to make it that way. There's you. Yeah. I got to speak with Brent, what in New Orleans a couple months ago. And then now uh, I just didn't ever realize I do this now. And I'm like, man, I thought I was tall. <laughs> Brent, Brent really shows me up. So I can't wait to see him again. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Jay. Is there anything you want to close with? No, man, thank you. I'm a fan of the show. I really appreciate what you do. And I'm looking forward to, to uh, hanging out in person in January. Awesome. Thanks. Well, hey, guys, with that being said, on behalf of Jay Martin and the Economic Ninja, we're out.